Hi, I'm Janine, and this is Outside the Box. On today's show, I'm in conversation with Kevin Suris. He's a Silicon Valley innovator, serial entrepreneur, CEO, TV personality, and edutainer. He's been featured in Business Week, Time, Fortune, Forbes, CNN, ABC, and so many other amazing outlets. It's my pleasure to welcome to the show Kevin Suris. Hi. I'm so happy to be back. I think we did this uh, back maybe 2004-ish. What do you think? When you when you did the TEDx event in Orange County. I've done a lot of them, but the Orange County one, TEDx OC, was 2004. Okay. No, it was the later one. It wasn't 2004. I think it was... Did you do one like 2014? 2014, not 2004. Okay. 2014. Okay. <laughs> I'm a decade. The decades just roll. It's all a blur. <laughs> yes, it's all a blur. But yeah, uh, eight years ago. That's right. So I reconnected with you because, as I mentioned, I was part, I was interviewing uh, Deborah DeFuria and Maria DC for uh, the big event with the Brown alumni yes. together apart. And I loved it. And Lisa Loeb was part of it and all these other amazing people. And I Lisa saw your name and I'm like, wait, there's only one Kevin Suris. That's got to be the guy. That's the guy. <laughs> it was. In fact, um, so uh, uh, Beth Wishney and, uh, and Lisa and others are, are friends of mine and they had this great idea to put together to actually create a Zoom musical, <clears throat> a musical about being in the pandemic and 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 have it sort of show up on Zoom. The, the problem is you can't actually do a musical on Zoom. And that's because of the delays. You can't actually right. sing together or do anything together. And that's an Internet delay. And it's not Zoom's fault. It just is what it is. So right. then they realized they had to find someone who knew how to do that. And I've I've been doing this sort of. Uh, uh, video work, video post production work for 20 years, in addition to my high tech stuff, right? So, uh, I, and I do it for Broadway and others, but a lot of musicals. Uh, and so I, I offered to donate my time because, uh, because of uh, it was for the Actors Fund. Great. And so I ended up building out the, the whole program. And, I, uh, and, and of course, you can't actually do these on Zoom. So you do them on phones mm -hmm. uh, in 4K. You set up your phone and you put a ring light, you do all that stuff. Yes. Yeah. Then they all come in as separate videos and they all have to be synced and then they and then we mock it up to as if it was on Zoom, but of course it's not actually on Zoom. Amazing. <clears throat> and um, you know, it's 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 an unbelievable amount of work. I think people don't understand uh, to 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 produce something of high quality like that takes between one hour and ten hours per minute of ending film. Whoa. So I didn't realize that production. There's one to ten hours per minute of outcome, right? And some of those took about 10 hours a minute and others of them took about 30 minutes, you know, per minute, but figure one to 10 hours. Now, if it was Hollywood, it'd be a hundred hours to a thousand hours per minute mm. of, of manpower to produce or women power or whatever human power yeah. to produce that outcome. Mm -hmm. um, so I think people don't realize that when they ask you, Hey, there's this 90 minute project. You wouldn't mind doing it. I knew what I was signing up for, but they had no idea it was going to be, you know, hundreds yeah. of hours of effort. Right. But, mm -hmm. but the outcome was great. And, uh, the great songs and fun, and you know, there was one uh, "Breathe" was 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 really heartfelt because, yeah. uh, and I'll end with this about this piece. It was really fascinating because um, it was written by African American artists and African American actors were in it, etc. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it was supposed to be each of these were someone's view of what happened in COVID. So you had teachers mm -hmm. talking about teaching online. You had all these yeah. different things and people dying or whatever. And then there was this. And their view of COVID was, yeah, COVID was going on, but it was really about Black Lives Matter and how that impacted us, how the, you know, the knee on the throat, of how that had a visceral impact. And they wanted to show that. So it was very interesting because you had a lot of fun and frolic in these, as musicals often are. Yes. And then you went really deep here and, you know, Reality. very emotional. Yeah. And then we had to bring people back out of that. But I, I, I constructed it in a way where you, you had these out of mind, out of body experiences. And we wanted to convey to the audience that, you know, if you were impacted by that, the way an African-American way, black person might have been in this country, mm -hmm. it was visceral. It was, yeah. it, and, and they tried to show that. And I think they really got that point across. So. I, I do too. Yeah. I thought it was excellent. I thought it flowed so well. It just gave us a taste of different lives. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, well, it was a fun project to work on many months, but uh, it's done. It's in the can and it opened and closed and everybody was happy. So we're good. Are people asking where they can see it again or if they missed it the first time? Or? Well, you know what? They can ask all they want. Um, all, most of those performers were union performers. You know, Joe Beth Williams was in it and others. Yes. 
And um, the union is very clear. You can donate your time to uh, a nonprofit like that. It can only be shown for 72 hours. And that's it. It can never be shown again. Got it. Okay. Those are the union rules. I don't make them. I, 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 I'm not sure I fully understand it. But I, I think they, you know, their view is these are actors who make their living doing this. And, um, and they don't want anything that goes out there in perpetuity. So it has it. a 72 hour window yeah. and, and that's it. Yeah, and, and that's it. So you either caught it or you didn't catch it. But um, yeah. but they raised a lot of money for for fund, which is which is really wonderful. All right, right. <laughs> you want to talk about AI? Do you want? <laughs> I would <laughs> love to. I I, I, I kind of want to know um, because you and are, are an entrepreneur. <laughs> you know, here this outside the box was created in response to the millions of people out of work, and. I'm so interested in advice you would give people that have had to pivot. Maybe they've lost their job and they're thinking, you know what? I want to be, not be an entrepreneur. What does it take right now? Sure. Oh, boy. Well, there's all, first of all, there's different levels of entrepreneurism, right? I mean, uh, you know, the, the person who starts the dry cleaner is an entrepreneur. Yes. That's an entrepreneur. They're doing a dry cleaner. They're probably, you know, probably unlikely to take that public, but nevertheless, it's a dry clean. Maybe with a SPAC, you know, a reverse merger into a SPAC is worth billions, but probably not. So <clears throat> you're an entrepreneur anytime you leave the big co corporate world and the safety of corporate world, even if yeah. it's a company of 30, 40 people, and you go out and you say, I'm going to start something on my own. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, the advice I give to all entrepreneurs, whether it's dry cleaner, or whether you want to start a tech startup is... Um, you have to be willing to fail and it's got to be okay and you can't get depressed about it yeah. because, True. you know, more than 90% of new businesses fail in, in all categories, mm -hmm. whether it's a restaurant or a tech company. And everyone, when they start their business, is sure they're not going to be one of the failures. Of course. But the stats are the stats, you know. I mean, I mean, some people start podcasts and radio shows, for example, and the chance of still doing it eight years or ten years later is very low. Yeah. So congratulations. But but most of the time, you know, so most of the time the problem is is they think they're going to make it. They I'm starting this uh, software. I'm going to write this app. I'm going to start this store. Whatever it is, you know, a year or two down the road, they put their heart and soul into it. It's not making any money. They got to go out and get a job. They feel like a failure. Yes. You're not a failure. You know, you, you learned a lot from that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you're going to take that learning into the next one and the next one. And some of the best entrepreneurs I know, uh, and many of the names you've seen out of Silicon Valley that have done very well, often had one or two or three absolute dogs before they had a winner. Very true. <clears throat> Sometimes in the same company where they had, Reva Slack is a great example. They, it was supposed to be a gaming company and they had revisited and revisited and revisited the the uh, business plan and finally just about out of money they noticed some people were using this little messaging thing they had on the side and they were talk they weren't playing any games they were just talking to each other and they go huh maybe, maybe there's <laughs> some money in that it's not what we want to do but there might be money in it and exactly. it turns out you know that was a multi-billion dollar idea as a matter of fact yeah and there you go so you have to be ready to fail you have to be okay with fail if you are not okay with okay. failure uh, if you if you if viscerally it's going to affect you in a way that is unhealthy, mm -hmm. don't be an entrepreneur. This Either is way. not your gig. It, you know. Mm -hmm. Also, if you're raising a you know you're raising a young family, you're the only wage earner. Probably not the right timing mm -hmm. to say I'm going to try making nothing for six months or a year or whatever. So 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 be sure. thoughtful about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, anyone could start their own business. Anyone could be uh, do anything. I mean that. That's what's wonderful, at least about the U.S. You know, this is this isn't some countries where you couldn't do that, but uh, but 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 you know, note that it may take you many many tries sure. before you have a success. Yes. Here's what I would say right now, at least in tech circles, we are seeing you know more Decacorns, which is a ten billion dollar valued company, many many you know hundreds and hundreds of unicorns and many Decacorns more than we've ever seen in anyone's lifetime. And some would say, well, there are too many. And I used to say, this is there's too many unicorns, right? We'd say, <clears throat> but it turns out that hasn't been the case. So now we have to say, why is it that it hasn't been the case? Why is it that many, many companies worth more than $10 billion are making it to the public market and are growing? You know, Coinbase is a great example, went public at nearly $100 billion. Well, I don't know if it's a 60 or 70 billion right now, something like yeah. that market cap. <clears throat> well, here's what's happening. It's fascinating. 
you know, when the internet first came out, you could go from zero to 10 or 20, 30,000, 50,000 users and you go, wow, this is incredible that I could do that in a two year time frame. We are now seeing whether it's restaurant delivery, some kind of delivery service or financial services or, or, or uh, insure tech, we are seeing companies literally that I see come by my desk and I probably get 20 startups come by my desk every day in terms of looking for funding or whatever. I have seen at least one or two a day out of 10 or 20 that have gone from zero two years ago, you know, when they started, they're only two or three years old, from zero to 50 million to 400 million, numbers like that in like two yeah. years. And, right. they, and it's in crazy industries. And they what they have figured out, they figured out how to get the return on ad spend just right. Whether it's going, most of these are going to consumer mm -hmm. in some way. Figure out how to get just right where it's four or five X and then they just plow money at it. And now it's just a formula as long as you haven't saturated the market. Yeah. And the internet is so large now with whatever, you know, several billion people worldwide on it that you literally can grow something that goes from zero to 50 to 400 to a billion. Um, oh. look, look at Coinbase revenue. I think it's a billion and a half a quarter right now. Mm -hmm. Another 12 years old, but a billion and a half dollars of revenue per quarter. Trading fake coins, by the way. Fake <laughs> coins, yeah. A billion and a half. A, do you know what it takes to build a five, six, seven billion dollar company? I don't know that they have a few hundred people there. Apparently, does. My point is, it doesn't take what it used to take. Yes. We figured out ways to hack the system in advertising and other things, and we're seeing even even brand new retailers, e-commerce retailers uh, that sell. Uh, you know, Gold Bell is an example. I'm an investor, so I won't give you the numbers, but mm -hmm. they're ginormous. Yeah. They're, they're incredible. Incredible. We're seeing lots of these things. So we're seeing growth at startups, certain kinds of startups that, that are generally consumer facing that we've never seen in the history of ever, because now is really the time for the internet, not the first internet boom yes. you know, from 2000 to 2008. But now is the time when you can really scale because all the systems are in place that if you do it right, the scale you can accomplish is unlike anything we've ever seen. Amazing. Amazing. And, you know, I see people of all ages starting businesses, little kids, you know, they find a need and they go for it. Start anything you want today. I mean, absolutely. Why not at any age? I, I had a business when I was a kid. I used to repair radios. I didn't make a lot of money, but I did repair radios and TVs and uh, got electrocuted a few times, but it didn't kill me. <laughs> I, I, I might have had more hair had, had that not happened. <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, yeah, why not? I was an entrepreneur at a young age. It's what I loved to do. I love to think up things. And I was always ahead of my time. I mean, I, I uh, at General Magic developed the first, uh, you know, virtual assistant. Her name was Mary, actually the actress, but but uh, the technology was called Portico. And we had millions of users on it. But, but ultimately, all of those patents from the mid 90s, ultimately got licensed for Siri and other things. And it, it's, what you have in Siri today, we had then, yeah, and and mm -hmm. um, and that was about twenty years ahead of time, as 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 it turns out. I, I can go down through through my list, and I'm often uh, you know a decade or two ahead of where people are. But but you can see that that's where we're going to be, and that's where we need to be. People might not be ready for it, but it's it's obvious that's where we want to be. Now, how did you get involved in AI? I've been involved in AI um, since the mid '90s, and it, it, some of the some of the first work I did was on artificial assistants, virtual assistants, and of course we use some AI algorithms to recognize for speech recognition, and then we extended that to say, you know, what is their intent? What are they trying to do? And try to get some intent out of out of what they're saying. We could understand millions of phrases, um, and we also used some basic tricks then too because we only had so much processing power, so we didn't have. You know, there was no deep learning. Uh, there were no deep neural nets then. You didn't have uh, such a thing that we have today. Today, the power of AI is quite interesting. <clears throat> Everyone wants to talk about neural nets. Oh, look what I can do with this neural net. Well, neural nets are good for some things. We have huge sets of data and it's very clean, huge, clean sets of data. But it turns out that that people really in industry are also using all of the, you know, up to 50 year old AI algorithms. And the reason is, it used to be that the processing power that some of those took, uh, even though they didn't need lots of clean data, they could work on a small amount of data, right? And curve fit and do some other things. Yeah. Uh, didn't it, it, it took a lot of processing power where 
it was impractical to do anything real time. But now with the cloud, you know, I can go borrow um, a few thousand cores, your CPU cores at mm-hmm. Amazon, and, um, and, and, and then release them in 10 minutes. It'll cost me, you know, a dollar to solve this immense problem with a 40-year-old algorithm which is perfectly good. And I don't need huge sets of data because we didn't have huge sets of data then. Couldn't work on them. So, um, so yes, people are using the traditional AI algorithms or traditional machine learning algorithms, as well as uh, the newest one since 2012, which is really one or two or three in GANs, you know, et cetera. Uh, but you just don't, you don't have always the, the data that Facebook had. So Facebook, when they first came up with facial recognition and said, should I tag your friend or should I tag your mom? It was spooky for a day or two, and then we just got used to it. So, uh, but they had a database of billions and billions of faces with names, most of which were the correct names to the face, most of which. And um, that was a great thing to train on. Most of us don't have access to that kind of data. We don't have billions of pieces of data that are that are that are, you know would allow us to do some kind of supervised learning because they have the answers. So so we're a little bit stuck, right? And and we're a little bit uh, uh, limited in the data that we have access to. So we've got to use the algorithms that work with whatever data we have. Sure. And and I encourage everybody to look at that. Um, and lastly, I'll say, <clears throat> you know. A real algorithmic research, coming up with new algorithms. You know, look, that's for Google. That's for academia. You can be an AI and you can use the math. When I talk about algorithms, AI algorithms, this is math that was developed over 50 or 60 years, right? Yes. You can pick up that math. It's published all over the place. You know, in fact, even code is written, right? And use it for your purpose. You've got some input data. You're looking for some outputs. You're going to curve fit, you're going to match, you're going to use random forest, you're going to whatever you're going to use to help you learn from and then decide in the future, based on what you learn, what you're seeing or what you're matching or whatever, right? So clearly, visual is done in certain ways, but all this data can be handled in so many other ways that's very reasonable. And so it's all about the application of AI today, my view. Sure. And then you have to have deep application knowledge, not about, uh, uh, oh, can I come up with a brand new algorithm? Good luck. There are academic, you know, people working on that and right. they'll work yeah, for seven exactly. years to come up with a new algorithm. So right. you're not going to. Why don't you apply what's out there to your problem, solve a problem, go on to the next one. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Can you imagine what it would feel like right now if you were just graduating college and your internship crashed and burned, the job you thought was going to happen, maybe New York or wherever. I mean, what what kind of advice uh, would you suggest or what are the key skills of somebody who's going to be resilient right now? Well, that's a great question. So so first of all, uh, yeah, let's deal with the question first and then we'll deal yeah. with an overall macro thing that's going on. Okay. So, so, so the first thing is clearly technical skills, if you have them, are very wanted. You know, there are millions of open jobs for coders and the like coders QA you know business analysts around technology I mean there are not enough people every major company in Silicon Valley has hundreds or thousands of openings so if you happened to go into CS or something like it or IT or whatever just go get another job there's plenty of jobs right. might not be where you want to be but plenty of jobs That's okay yeah now, the, 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 not everybody goes into tech degrees. You know, that is, I don't know, 20 or 30 percent of the of the country. And so you've got a lot of people in um, in everything from liberal arts to business, etc. Those jobs are a little harder, but they're not impossible to find. Yeah. Uh, but they're a little harder because, um, you know, because of COVID and what happened. And yes, your internship blew up and died. And now you don't have that experience and, 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 yeah. <clears throat> you know, look, my advice is monster, indeed, LinkedIn, work the system. Yeah. There are at least 8 million open jobs in the United States today. 8 at million. Least, 8 million. 8 million. That's according to yeah. the Commerce Department. Someone, I, I read somewhere else is 15 million, but let's call it 8 million, right? Mm-hmm. Now, that includes restaurants that can't find anyone, which is a whole other issue. Yeah. Um, but it includes all kinds of business oriented jobs where people have retired or people have passed away or, or whatever. Um, the interesting thing is there is more money to spend. I, I, I'm going to rephrase it. 
there is this sense of, oh, COVID decimated economies. Now I'm going to separate it is decimating economies, but let's look at the United States. Yeah. COVID absolutely decimated the restaurant industry, except for the strong ones that are now open and can't find workers. And mm -hmm. something like 100,000 restaurants went out of business. That is horrifying because that, that is hundreds of thousands of workers. And th that those restaurants are coming back. Mm -hmm. Now, the flip side of that is some people would say most of those restaurants were barely hanging on by a thread. They couldn't get PPP loans. They couldn't. And I'm not making any excuse. I'm not saying they should have gone or shouldn't gone. There's restaurants I love that are gone. Yeah. You know, the owners decide to give up the ghost, whatever. Sure. But what you have coming out are the strongest. The strongest survive these. Survival of the fittest. Of it is survival of the fittest. Yeah. Darwin, Darwin at work here. Mm -hmm. I say it's fair because life is definitely not fair. And it is not mm -hmm. fair to those people who maybe spent 20 years building that restaurant business and it collapsed under them in three weeks, right? They, yeah. couldn't, they couldn't do deliveries, they, whatever the case is. I get that. And I didn't say it's fair. But what I can say is that um, almost every restaurant in this country, based on all of the data that I've recently read, are begging for workers. There are restaurants around here that can't open because they can't get enough workers to open the door. And the signs are there and they're begging and they're trying to interview and there's nobody there. <clears throat> Why aren't they there? Well, yeah, one, you know, the, 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 the uh, government subsidies for staying home right now are still intact till September. So, yeah. Why, why go back to work? That is one. Number two, people are looking for a higher wage before they go back to that. And number three, something that people aren't talking about, during COVID, during COVID, Amazon, during COVID, hired 500,000 workers at over $15 an hour in their, in their uh, warehouses. Well, and They're giving them um, not only a good wage, but, but they're giving them uh, benefits as well. Mm -hmm. And those workers who probably often used to work in restaurants, they're not going back. No. They don't want to work in the restaurant. I I, in, in fact, for some areas of the country, they might be making twice what they used to make. It's, 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 uh, it's easier work. They know what their hours are. They love it. And this is a fascinating thing. So we took half a million people out of the job market that, you, that used to work in these other roles, and they're not going to come back to those roles. No. This is happening on Broadway. You know, we're trying to reopen Broadway. I'm involved in Broadway, as you know. And a lot of the people who work there, including actors, and I don't mean the named people, but levels down, right? Yeah. <clears throat> they went back home. They became real estate agents. They became something else. Mm -hmm. They said, "This uh, I, I'm done. I can't live 18 months with no income. No I'm leaving way. New York City. And then they're not coming back. Yeah. They went back to Kansas. They're not going back. They found well, they, a job there. They couldn't pay their rent in New York, that's for they sure. They couldn't pay their rent in New York. They're now working for an Amazon warehouse, and on the side, they're a real estate agent. They are done. Yeah. You're, not, you're not getting them back. And then, by the way, this is ticket takers. It's people in lighting. It's a st stage people. The whole you know, crew and, yeah. you know, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, this, is, this is a real rethink of where jobs are in America and, and, and what jobs you want. And look, working in a restaurant. Did you ever work in a restaurant? Yes. In Syracuse. <laughs> in Syracuse, which one? Uh, let's see. The, uh, the Orange. It was, it was a restaurant and bar. I learned to bartend and a place called King David's. Before yeah, I, I think they're high. both there on uh, Armory Square. Um, no, King David's is on campus. Oh, okay. Um, right near the Varsity. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I know. Cosmo and all those places. Um, yeah. And I did not know how to waitress, but I watched. I worked takeout. And then I became a waitress. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And it's a hard job. Very hard. Right. You're on your feet. It's hard. People are demanding. And then you've satisfied them, but the next people come in and they're just as demanding. They're and degrading too. They're, the people are rude. People are rude. Well, they're Americans. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this isn't Japan. <laughs> <laughs> or, or the UK. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, look, I, I think that there's a, 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 an awakening mm -hmm. <clears throat> post-COVID of what jobs people want and some jobs that people just don't want. And you're going to have to really raise, raise the wage. And, yes, that causes inflation. Mm -hmm. But eventually, you know, the wages are going to be what it takes people to fill the jobs. And, you know, water does find its own level. And sometimes it needs a good shot in the arm. Mm -hmm. But water finds its own level. And if, the, and, and, and if you have to make $22 an hour to attract enough waiters or waitresses, well, then that's what it is. Yeah. And that's what it'll be in a particular area. And when the wages get to that, then you'll be able to fill the place with, with wait staff. It, yes. Fine. 
and I don't know what the number is, but you'll it'll it'll find its way. It's just how it works. And restaurants always say, "Well, I can't possibly raise the prices." Well, you're either going to raise your prices, lower your profit, or not be in business because you can't get workers. I mean, exactly. it's just the cost. Of, and by the way, everyone around you will have to do the same. Right <clears throat> now, the other thing that happened is. You know, the U.S. government put out four or five trillion dollars of aid, you know, during mm -hmm. COVID. That money goes into the economy. It circulates into the economy in a variety of ways. I didn't say it gets to everyone. And again, I want to be clear. It's not fair to life isn't fair to everybody. Yeah. But that money is rotating in the economy. So, in fact, if you look at consumer spending, it's up. It is up. Um, yeah. in, in fact, some things are at record levels. The recovery of the economy is at record levels. We've never seen a recovery like that. It is very likely to mimic the roaring 20s of 100 years ago <clears throat> because we came out of the same thing for 18 okay. to 24 months. Interesting. And so, um, um, yes, we read about, and, and there surely are some people that still can't find a job or have been displaced in some way, but, but mostly, and it's not just billionaires. I, I know billionaires have made money, but it's mostly, uh, you know, everyone that has a little more money than they had coming in. One of the reasons they didn't go on vacations, they didn't spend as much going out, they didn't go out to dinner, they didn't do anything, they didn't go to, didn't go to the movies, didn't do anything, they sat home and watched Netflix for $9 a month or whatever, $14 a month now, whatever it is, right? So there's more money than there ever has been. People are willing to go out and spend it. They are going on vacation like there's no tomorrow. Air traffic is back to just about where it was pre-pandemic, except pre-pandemic, it was 70% business travelers. Now it's 100% non-business. Did you see the numbers on Memorial Day weekend, the travel? Yeah. yeah. 37 two, million? Two million. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's, it's the rate it was before, but, but it switched. The yeah. people who are going out are spending their own money. This is not business travel. Business travel is still 70% down. Yeah. So, so the uh, consumers made up the rest and they're going to Hawaii. They're going to Florida. They're going to any beach they can find. Uh, they'll go to the Grand Canyon. They'll go anywhere they can fly, sure. anywhere they can get a seat. This they're is crazy. fascinating. Yeah, it really so, is. So people have money. Again, I'm, I'm making a grand, broad statement here it when i say people it doesn't mean some people some people are are, are harmed but yes. overall there's more money to spend than there ever has been in this country in the history of ever interesting now i know you have done uh, different talks and things when if people want to see some of the things you've done are they all on your website i know i put them on my website yes um uh, there there are many actually all they're, they're not necessarily on my website but you can just search for my name <laughs> okay. on YouTube, i think 70 or 80 talks come up of something right well, or, i did put them on otbseries.com oh wonderful uh, a whole all your links and different things you sent me so they're on there oh great go there go there <laughs> more more traffic for janine that's good and so any last bit of advice you want to leave us with Maybe you have a mantra. <laughs> well, look, um, I think when when um, when I get up every day, uh, uh, my friend Goldie Hawn taught me this. As a matter of fact, I love Goldie. Oh, she's great. And, and she looked at me one day and she said, "You know what? You and I, Kevin, we're alike in one way." So, what is that? We both have high dopamine. Like I get up, and this is great. This is going to be a wonderful world and it's a wonderful day and whatever's going to come at me, we're going to conquer and we're going to have fun. And, and you know, so it's a, it's a little bit of an attitude of, you know, is the glass half full or the glass half empty, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's a long way you can go with attitude. Uh, there really is. And, and yes, you know, in the middle of COVID, you go, what, what could we find that was wonderful? You know what? My wife and I, we made beautiful dinners and we had them in our formal dining room. Nice. All the way through. Love we it. said we're going to honor the dinner. And we're going to honor the dining room. And yep, we're in the middle of COVID and can't leave the house. We'll have food delivered. Uh, but we made our meals. We didn't have pre-made food. And um, and we enjoyed every meal. We thought about what we're going to have. And we had it in this formal way. And we had music on or piano playing or something. Nice. And so, um, so we found something good in everything. Find something good in everything. Every day you get up and, and you'll have a better day. I love that. Thank you so much, Kevin. I've really enjoyed this. Anytime. It's great to see you.